you all to the Lord's house this evening. It's good to see each one gathered with us in the Lord's house. Um, I want to read some well-known words from Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore, the life of in him. Faithful God we have, great is his faithfulness. We'll seek the Lord's face in prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank thee as we draw nigh this evening that the Lord's people can say, The Lord is my portion. What a faithful God he has been to us. And we pray this evening that we will be helped in this season of worship. We pray that our hearts will be lifted up afresh to thee. And Lord, be pleased, we pray, to come and to minister to each waiting soul. Grant that help from heaven, then we do ask in our Lord's great name. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn in our hymn books, please, to the hymn number 50. The hymn number 50 on the page 196. The hymn number 50 on the page 196. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. And it's fantastic.
seek the Lord again, please, in prayer. Let us look to the Lord again. Our gracious Father, we give thee thanks that on another Lord's Day evening that we are able to come and meet together in the Lord's house. O oh Lord, we thank thee that thou hast given us a day to worship thy name. And what a blessing that each week we can step aside from those things that <coughs> occupy us and preoccupy us from day to day. And on this day, our attention is brought to our Lord, thy great wonder in redemption, thy daily mercies. And, O oh Lord, we pray that in our time this evening that the gospel again will be a means of blessing to every soul. And we desire that we will live gospel-centered lives, that the gospel will truly transform us and that we will be made more and more into the very image of our Savior. We need thy help in this season. There are so many issues that press in upon our minds and we pray then for help to be delivered from distracting thoughts. And for this time that our hearts will be opened, that thy word will be that examining tool of our souls fresh. We pray that the Holy Spirit will take the word and search us out tonight. And Lord, that we will be more conformed to thine image then through it. We pray for any that will hear thy word this evening that are still without thee. O oh Lord, we long to see precious souls brought to thyself. We thank thee for the great promises of thy word to that end. We pray then that thou wilt come and visit us and that we will know times of refreshing, that we will see precious souls being brought unto thyself. O oh Lord, we pray that even in these dark times, that thou wilt raise up a testimony, and that thou wilt save souls for the glory of thy great name. O oh Lord, we pray that you will bless every outreach endeavor of this congregation, we pray that where the seed is sown, we pray that there will be a beautiful harvest. So Lord, we pray for those that cannot be with us this evening, whatever their circumstances, we pray very especially for the sick of this congregation. Oh Lord, we pray that thy preserving hand will be upon them, and that thou will be pleased to raise up the sick to greater measure health and strength. And Lord, we pray for light gatherings across our land tonight. O oh Lord, we pray that wherever God's word is declared faithfully, that you will encourage your people. And as, as has been prayed, we pray that souls will be brought into that great time. So come and minister to our waiting souls, we pray in our Lord's great name. We're going to turn again in our hymn books, please, to the paraphrases, and it's the paraphrase 58, the paraphrase 58 on the page 166, based on words in the latter part of Hebrews 4, uh, bringing us to see that Jesus Christ is our great sympathizing high priest, that as he took humanity to himself, uh, that as he is God manifest in flesh, he is that one that sympathizes with us. So, the paraphrase 58, where high the heavenly temple stands.
words, those are in the verse 5, and every pang that rends the heart, the man of sorrows, the heart sympathizes with our grief and to the sufferer. We're going to turn this evening for our scripture reading to Ezekiel 23. In Ezekiel 23, it is a long chapter, but we're going to take the time to read God's Word together. It's not an easy chapter to read as the sin of Jerusalem and the sin of Judah it is described in terms of harlotry, immorality. Uh, so we have here another one of the allegories in the book of Ezekiel. As I've said, very solemn reading. In many senses, difficult to read in Ezekiel 23 and verse 1. The word of the Lord came on to me. Sorry, the word of the Lord came again. In Egypt, they committed whoredoms in their youth. There were their breasts pressed, and there they bruised the teats of their virginity. The names of them were Ahola the elder, and Aholibah her sister, and they were mine. They bear sons and daughters, thus were their names Samaria. Ahola and Jerusalem, the Holy Bar. And the Hola led the harlot, and she was mine, and she doted on her lovers, as the Assyrians her neighbours, which were clothed with blue, captains and rulers, all of them desirable young men, horsemen riding upon horses. Thus she committed her hordes with them, with all them that were the chosen men of Assyria, and with all on whom she doted, with all their idols she defiled herself. Neither left she her whoredoms brought from Egypt, for in her youth they lay with her, and they bruised the breast of their virginity, and poured their whoredom upon her. Wherefore, I have delivered her into the hand of her lovers, into the hand of the Assyrians, upon whom she doted. These discovered her nakedness, they took her sons and her daughters, and slew her with the sword, and she became famous among women, for they had executed judgment upon her. When her sister Aholibah saw this, she was more corrupt in her inordinate love than she, and in her <coughs> boredoms more than her sister in her boredoms. She doted upon the Assyrians, her neighbors, Captains and rulers clothed most gorgeously, horsemen riding upon horses, all of them desirable young men. Then I saw that she was defiled, that they took both one way, and that she increased her boredoms. For when she saw men portrayed upon the wall, the images of the Chaldeans portrayed with vermilion, girded with girdles upon their loins, exceeding in dyed attire upon their heads, all of them princes to look to after the manner of the Babylonians of Chaldea, the land of their nativity. And as soon as she saw them with her eyes, she doted upon them and sent messengers on to them into Chaldea. And the, Babylons, sorry, the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love and they defiled her with their boredom. She was polluted with them, and her mind was alienated from them. And so she discovered her boredoms and discovered her nakedness. Then my mind was alienated from her, like as my mind was alienated from her sister. Yet she multiplied her boredoms, and calling to remembrance the days of her youth, wherein she had played the harlot in the land of Egypt. For she doted upon their Paramours, whose flesh is as the flesh of asses, and 
whose issue is like the issue of horses. Thus, thou calls to remembrance the lewdness of thy youth, and bruising thy teeth by the Egyptians for the paps of thy youth. Therefore, O Aholibah, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will raise up thy lovers against thee, from whom thy mind is alienated, and I will bring against thee on every side the Babylonians and all the Chaldeans, Pekod and Jehoah, Koah, and all the Assyrians with them, all of them desirable young lords, captains and rulers, great lords and renowned of all them, riding upon horses. They shall come against thee with chariots, wagons and wheels, and with an assembly of people which shall set against thee buckler and shield and helmet round about. And I will set judgment before them, and they shall judge thee according to their judgments. And I will set my jealousy against thee, and they shall deal furiously with thee. They shall take away thy nose and thine ears, and thy remnant shall fall by the sword. They shall take thy sons and thy daughters, and thy residue shall be devoured by the fire. They shall also strip thee out of thy clothes, and take away thy fair jewels. Thus will I make thy lewdness to cease from thee, and thy whoredom brought from the land of Egypt, so that thou shalt not lift up thine eyes unto them, nor remember Egypt any more. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will deliver thee into the hand of them whom thou hatest, into the hand of them from whom thy mind is alienated. And they shall deal with thee hatefully, and shall take away all thy labor, and shall leave thee naked and bare, and the nakedness of thy whoredom shall be discovered, both thy lewdness and thy whoredoms. I will do these things unto thee, because thou hast gone, gone a whoring after the heathen, because thou art polluted with their idols. Thou hast walked in the way of thy sister, therefore will I give her cup into thy hand. Thus saith the Lord God, thou shalt drink of thy sister's cup deep and large. Thou shalt be laughed to scorn, and had in derision, containeth much. Thou shalt be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, with the cup of astonishment and desolation, with the cup of thy sister Samaria. Thou shalt even drink it and suck it out, and thou shalt break the shirts thereof and pluck off thine own breasts, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast forgotten me and cast me behind thy back, therefore bear thou also thy lewdness and thy holiness. The Lord said, Moreover unto me, son of man, wilt thou judge Ahola and Aholaba? Yea, declare unto them their abominations, that they have committed adultery, and blood is in their hands, with their idols have they committed adultery, and have also caused their sons whom they bear unto me to pass for them through the fire to the barley. Moreover, this they have done unto me, they have defiled my sanctuary in the same day, and have profaned my Sabbaths. For when they have slain their children to their idols, then they came the same day into my sanctuary to profane it. And lo, thus have they done it in the midst of mine house. Furthermore, ye have sent for men to come from far, unto whom a messenger was sent. And lo, they came whom thou didst wash thyself, paintest, paintest thy eyes, and deckest thyself with ornaments, and saddest upon a stately bed, and a table prepared before it, whereupon thou hast set mine incense and mine oil. And the voice of a multitude being at ease was with her, with the men of the common sort were brought Sabaeans from the wilderness, which put bracelets upon their hands and beautiful crowns upon their heads. Then said I unto her that was old and adulterous, Will they now commit whoredoms with her? And she with them, yet they went in unto her, 
as they go in unto a woman that fled the harlot. So went they in unto a hola, and unto a holaba, the lewd women. Righteous men, they shall judge them after the manner of adulteresses, and after the manner of women that shed blood, because they are adulteresses, and blood is in their hands. For thus saith the Lord God, I will bring up a company upon them, and give them to be removed and spoiled. The company shall stone them, they shall slay their sons and their daughters, and burn up their houses with fire. Thus will I cause lewdness to see sight of the land, that all women may be taught not to do after your lewdness. And they shall recompense your lewdness upon you, and ye shall bear the sins of your idols, and ye shall know that I am the Lord God. We'll end the reading there, knowing the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his precious truth. We will have the Catechism at uh, this stage, and it's the question 116, and we'll repeat the answer please together. What is required in the fourth commandment? The fourth commandment requires of all men the sanctifying or keeping holy to God such set times as he has appointed in his word expressly one whole day of seven which was the seventh from the beginning of the world to the resurrection of Christ, and the first day of the week ever since, and so to continue to the end of the world, which is the Christian Sabbath, and in the New Testament called the Lord's Day. And so as we saw last week, the fourth commandment is abiding, it is not to some have asserted something that is a temporary and the Lord he gave the Sabbath to man and has given it to man before the time that we are here on earth and the fact that it's in the Ten Commandments is evidence of that remember the Ten Commandments were written in stone and many make the comment that that was to show their perpetuity it wasn't that God wrote them on paper that could easily fall apart, written on stone, uh, indicating their permanent validity. And our Lord upheld that when he said in his ministry, the Sabbath was made for man. And so the answer here begins, the fourth commandment requires of all men. And so the writers of the Confession and Catechisms were arguing then that the Sabbath is not just for the Jewish man, nor even for the Christian man, but this Sabbath requirement is actually of all men. And the, the, the ungodly, as they ignore the Sabbath day, they are in breach of the commandment. And of course, tragically, so many of the Lord's people in our day, as they ignore the Sabbath day, they are breaking the commandment of the Lord. And the commandment expressly says then there are six days for labor and one day for rest. It does not say that it must be a particular day for rest in the Old Testament. It was to be the seventh day after six days of labor there would be the seventh day of Saturday, the Sabbath, but as the answer here is indicating in the New Testament, that has changed to Sunday to the first day of the week. Now, among the Seventh day Adventists and others, uh, there will be this claim that it was Constantine that changed the day from uh, Saturday to Sunday, from the seventh day to the first. Now, Constantine certainly did issue a decree in relation to the first day of the week but it was not him that commenced the idea of worshipping on the first day of the week we'll see in a moment or two that uh, that began in the book of acts and so that principle was established i believe before acts we see it in the, the gospel of john but the principle was established 
in the New Testament. Uh, what Constantine was doing was putting it, enshrining it into law. We have a new a premier in Western Australia. Imagine tomorrow if the premier decrees that we're all to drive on the left-hand side of the road. It would be a foolish thing to say that the premier changed the side that we drive on the road. Rather, he would be merely putting into law what is already the practice. And so it was when Constantine said, as he did speak of uh, the first day, he was putting into law what already uh, into legal law, into uh, secular law, what was already being practiced uh, by Christians at that particular time. It was really written into law then for the protection of Christians. In Acts chapter 20, in Acts chapter 20, and we see there how the Christians were observing the first day as their day of worship. Acts chapter 20, verse 7, upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. And so here was the, the practice that each first day of the week the disciples would come together. And as the Lord had established the first day in his resurrection, it was upheld then by those early believers. And we have another example in 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. If you've ever read Jehovah Witnesses, or not Jehovah Witnesses, Seventh day Adventist comments on verse 2. You, I'm sure, have been surprised at how they can deal with that text. And they have a most unusual explanation where they say that they had met, God's people met on the Saturday, Sabbath, but then they just came together to hand in their collection on the first day of the week. But of course, that is not what the words here are saying at all. Uh, upon the first day of the week, as the Lord's people gather, they bring their offering with them, and let every one of you lay by him and still as God and prosper him. Uh, Paul here is making it clear that the first day of the week was the day when the Lord's people gathered together to worship. Our Lord rose on the first day of the week. Pentecost was on the first day of the week, he ministered to his disciples on the first day of the week. And so we recognize this day then as the day of our Lord's resurrection. And while in the Old Testament they honored creation, and of course we do, we rejoice in that, but we rejoice then in redemption, in the redemptive work of our Lord Jesus Christ. I trust the Lord bless these new thoughts to our hearts. We're going to turn in our hymn books again, and as we sing the next hymn, we will worship the Lord with our offerings. 281, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. 281, remaining seated.
We will turn again, Ezekiel, please, to Ezekiel 23. Ezekiel 23 and verse 27. Thus will I make thy lewdness to truth. Our gracious Father, we thank Thee that your redeeming love, the, the shed blood of Christ, will be the theme of the Lord's people's song through all eternity. And we thank Thee for that fountain that has been opened up for sin and uncleanness. And O oh Lord, we do pray that as we come then and meditate upon Thy word, that the help of God will be granted. O oh Lord, minister to every one of our souls through thy truth. Grant that the help of the Spirit of God, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. There are certainly messages given to Old Testament prophets. upon the shoulders of the prophets. In our day, entertaining. What it was for Ezekiel to be given, Ezekiel 23, Imagine what it was to sit and to hear Ezekiel share that message. In Ezekiel 23, we have another allegory, and this time of two ladies, two sisters. And the two the sisters represent the two kingdoms, and very especially the two capital cities of the Promised Land. And that is, one represents Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, the other represents Jerusalem, the capital of the southern kingdom of Judah. And so the first is Ahola, and Ahola meaning her tent, and Ahola is Samaria, uh, we are told in the chapter, in verse 4, Ahola means her tent. Cassenius in his lexicon suggests that uh, it could be translated, she has her own tent. She has her own tent. But a whole of Ah then represents Jerusalem. And a whole of Ah means my tent is in her. My tent is in her. Now some commentators in the book of Ezekiel uh, suggest that the, the names themselves are not very important. That all that the translated tent that is names. Oh hell. Uh, so it becomes then a hola, a holiba. Uh, oh hell not only means tent, but it was one of the words that was used in the Old Testament to describe the tabernacle. Uh, that very special tent, the, the tabernacle of the congregation, uh, as it's sometimes referred to, uh, and interestingly, in the latter part of Ezekiel, where 
Uh, there is that extended section on the temple. Uh, the word tent is actually used in that particular section, Ezekiel 41 and verse 1. It mentions the tabernacle, the tent. When Israel broke off from Judah, that is in the early kingdom years when there was a division of the kingdom and the northern tribes went their own way, there was an abandonment of the temple. And so when Israel broke off from Judah, they abandoned the temple that was in Jerusalem. And Israel set up her own worship. So for example, 1 Kings 12 verse 32, it speaks of Jeroboam ordaining the feast in the eighth month, in the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar. And so he knew about what the law had outlined as far as the feasts were concerned, the ceremonial aspects of the Old Testament. And it goes on then to say, So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. And to use this language then we could say, they have tents. They have tents. But it wasn't the Lord's. They set up their alternative. They set up their alternative worship. Now Jerusalem still had the tent. And of course now it's not something that's made out of fabric and animal skins and poles and posts and timber. They have the tent. Well, tragically, it was no longer a place of worship. And so, in Ezekiel 23, and the verse 38, it says, Moreover, this have they done unto me, they have defiled my sanctuary. In the same day, they have profaned my Sabbaths. For when they had slain their children to their idols, then they came this day into my sanctuary to profane. Lo, thus have they done in the midst of my house. And the Lord can say then that his house, his sanctuary, his tent, it's in him. And Jerusalem then had added responsibility. They had added privilege and none of that would excuse what the northern kingdom had done. And yet Jerusalem did have this benefit, this blessing, that in her was this building presenting not only the message of sin and how man was alienated from God, but then a picture that there was access to God through the work of the coming Redeemer. And so what was the purpose of the allegory? It was not intended to do any good to Samaria. And so Ezekiel 23, the intention was not to do any good to the northern kingdom. It was already gone. Rather, the message is a warning to Judah, to the southern kingdom. A message to Jerusalem. It, it yet stands. And through the chapter, it's as if the Lord is saying, how can you do the very as Samaria set up their own worship and profaned the things of the Lord, how could you, having the temple and having all of that blessing, do the very same thing. How could you bring this profanity? And so in the chapter then, Judah's sin and Israel's sin is likened unto gross immorality. And what a solemn graphic description is given. And some have said that the chapter, Ezekiel 23, doesn't have anything positive to say. 
that it's all just doom. But that's not the case. And so I've already read again in your hearing the words of verse 27, at the beginning of the verse at least, and then verse 48. Thus will I make thy lewdness to cease. Thus will I cause lewdness to cease out of the land. Verse 27 and verse 48. Are those words not extremely positive? I will cause the lewdness in the land to cease. Here is good news. Now the word that's translated lewd here, lewdness, the original Hebrew word, it can be used in a number of different ways to describe sin. But when you trace that word through the Old Testament, in the vast majority of uses, and not, not all, but the vast majority of uses, it is used as it's used in this chapter in relation to moral uncleanness. <coughs> and so lewd in that way is a very accurate translation. Immorality. The Lord says, I will cause the uncleanness to cease. I will cause the fornication. I will cause the adultery to cease. And so with the destruction of Jerusalem, there would come an end to the spiritual adultery. And I've mentioned before, in previous messages that when the captivity did come to an end while there were many problems there was one thing that was very much in the positive and that was that idolatry was put away and so following the captivity idolatry was put away and in that sense we can say that these words were fulfilled I will make thy lewdness <coughs> to cease but how does this relate to us in Perth in 2023? Surely one takeaway must be that God's people must put away all uncleanness. God's people must put away all fornication. God's people must put away all literal adultery and lust. Ephesians 5.3 but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you. God's people are to be a holy people. And where there has been a breach of that seventh commandment, it is to be repented of, the sin is to be forsaken. Fornication and all uncleanness, let it not be once named among you. Another great takeaway surely is this. It's God's purpose to cleanse his church. Of that sin in the seventh adultery, most certainly. And it's God's purpose to cleanse his church in the broadest sense to put away uncleanness from among us. And how then we must rejoice in these words in verse 48. Thus will I cause lewdness to cease out of thy land. Here we see the Lord's purpose to remove uncleanness from his church. Uh, so this evening, with the help of God, I want to apply this very especially to the believer. Uh, of course, equally, uh, these words could be taken evangelically. Uh, it's the Lord's purpose that a sinner might be cleansed, that the sinner in his uncleanness, the sinner in his condemnation, that they would come for cleansing. But this evening, with the help of God, I want to look at in this direction, that the believer, that the, the people of God, are to be cleansed. I want to see, first of all, with you, the believer's goal. The believer's goal. Remember, in Ephesians chapter 5, maybe we can turn there. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul speaks about marriage, what marriage is to look like, and what marriage symbolizes. Ephesians 5 verse 25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he 
might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And so Christ's purpose is to sanctify and cleanse his church. He does so through the scriptures that are given. There's this washing of water by the word. And in the context then, Paul is saying that husbands are to work for the good of their wives' sanctification. The husband is to love his church. Sorry, the husband is to love his wife as Christ loved his church. But notice then verse 27. That Christ loves the church. And he operates for the church's sanctification, the church's cleansing, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Here is God's purpose that the church would be without spot, without any blemish, no wrinkle. And when the Church of Christ is finally presented in her fullness and glory. She will be presented without spot. Uh, this, of course, is also true in a legal sense, as we have been justified, legally speaking, having the righteousness of Christ. We are without spot, without wrinkle. We are holy and without blemish. But of course we have this problem outwardly. We have this problem with our indwelling sin. And so, as God's people, we have this realization. One day, all uncleanness in every sense will be put away out of the land. Uncleanness will be put out of the church. The church will be presented as a glorious spotless church. That then is the end. That is our destination. Every living stone in that great temple will be clean. Yet God's word never teaches that God is only concerned about the cleanliness of his bride in eternity. Now certainly the bride will be perfectly clean in eternity in every sense. But God's word teaches that God is concerned about the cleansing of his bride now. And so in Ephesians chapter 5, Christ is not merely going to sanctify and cleanse his church in the future. But he is sanctifying and cleansing his church now. And so it's God's purpose for us here on earth to be a clean people. And so 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14, it says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, that is, as we are looking for a new heaven and a new earth, as we look for the Lord's return, as we look for the bride to be presented spotless in glory, Peter says, Be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. That is, right now, we are to give diligence to put away uncleanness. We are to give diligence to live without spot. Now we recognize that we have this problem <coughs> with our flesh. We have this problem with indwelling sin. And we will never know this side of eternity, that perfect cleansing and that outward sense of sanctification. But we are to give diligence. We are to be diligent in putting away uncleanness. Here is the believer's goal. This is to be our goal. And that is God has purposed that the uncleanness would cease. Our desire is to be, let me be, as it's possible for a saved sinner to be. The believer's goal. But I want to see then, secondly, the believer's horror. The believer's horror. Now, there's very solemn words at the end of the chapter. In the, the verse 47, and well, verse 45, it speaks about the righteous man. And then verse 47, the company shall stone them with stones and dispatch them 
with their swords. And so, in the allegory, and remember it is an allegory, there is this reference then back to the law. What was the punishment for adultery under the law? The punishment was death by stoning. Now that did not mean that everyone who committed adultery in the Old Testament was stoned to death, but it was the penalty that could be enacted. And in oc on occasions when the adulterer was spared or the adulteress was spared, they were to be forever grateful that mercy was shown. And so here in this allegory, you have the, the sisters and their adulteresses. And what does the law say? The law says death by stoning. And we've got so far in our time from thinking things through a biblical lens and that we wonder at that. And we say death by sin, or sorry, death by stoning. It seems so harsh. And the reason why we think like that is because we don't see sin as God sees it. And as God saw the wickedness of sin, he rightly said the deserved penalty is death. But what was the purpose behind the story? Now, there are contemporary writers and they criticize in their folly, they criticize the latter part of Ezekiel chapter 23 and this stoning, but they fail to recognize the purpose that lay behind it. And so if you look with me in verse 48 again, thus will I cause lewdness to cease out of the land, that all women may be taught not to do after your lewdness. The purpose behind the stoning was to teach the nation. And it was to show them the awfulness of sin. And it was to show them the heinousness of sin. And it was to warn others not to follow in the path of those that had engaged in the sin. I believe in days past, the death penalty was an effective warning. Imagine if you were to witness the hanging of a murderer or some other criminal. If you were disposed to commit such a crime, would you remember what you had witnessed when you saw the murderer hung? And so it was in the Old Testament. As they witnessed death by stoning, it was to teach them, and it did teach them, the horrific nature of sin. Now there is such a thing as spiritual adultery. If you could turn with me please to James chapter 4. And so we want to take this then and apply it to ourselves in our time. James chapter 4 and the verse 4. James chapter 4 and verse 4, the adulterers and adulteresses, interestingly, sadly, in some of the modern versions that the word adulteresses is left off, and they just have adulterers, and they will say, well, it's not really much of an issue, is it? But the reason, surely, why both is given is to emphasize the importance of the message that's brought. Everyone's to listen. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. And when the professed child of God then loves the things of the world, when they embrace the things of the world, James says you're committing adultery. <coughs> In a congregation where there is such sin, you're adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Now remember, 
Jerusalem was a whole of I. My tent is in her. My temple is in her. My dwelling is in her. Jerusalem, you see, speaks of the professing church of Jesus Christ. The Lord's dwelling is in his people. The ungodly are like a whole of them. They have erected their own tent. But we claim that the Lord is in us. We claim that the Holy Spirit is in us. And James surely is saying here, how can it be that on the one hand you say the Lord is dwelling in you, that God would say over you, my tent is in her. And yet at the same time you would have friendship with the world. It's incompatible. And this is what James is teaching us. And, and therefore it parallels with those words that Paul was writing to the, the church at Corinth, What know ye not that he which is joined to and hearted is one body? He says then, flee fornication. <coughs> know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? We are to keep ourselves, as it were, pure unto the Lord, not mixing with the world. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, what fellowship? Hath righteousness with all righteousness. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? What agreement does the body of the child of God have with worldliness? James says, you can't both. It's the sin of adultery. What is it to a friendship with the world? James, of course, is not saying that we are to that we're forbidden from befriending godly people. That is not what James is saying. James is not saying go and hide yourself away from society around you. And scripture makes it clear that we are to minister to people. The love of the world has to do with loving their entertainment. Loving their laughter. Loving the things that they put their confidence in and us putting our confidence in them as well. To love the world would be to trust in our riches. Ian e. Bound said the love of the world is hostile to and destructive of the love of God. The two cannot coexist. Yet many modern church members and churchgoers are friends of the world. It's advocates and lovers. And what is the message then of Ezekiel 23 to our hearts? Put away the uncleanness. Put away the idol of loving the things of the world. Now, if you turn with me then to Revelation 2. Revelation 2, uh, the first letter to the seven churches was addressed to Ephesus. In Revelation chapter 2, and in the letter to Ephesus in the verse 4, uh, having spoken of positive things in the congregation, uh, Revelation 2, 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Thou hast left thy first love. I hadn't. Gone to the back. <coughs> there was love of something else. What does it say in verse 5? Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. And the Lord says, if you don't repent of forsaking that first love, I'll remove the witness. Because the Lord is intent on removing the uncleanness. The Lord is intent on removing the uncleanness. Now I should say there that when it says, I have somewhat against thee, thou hast left thy first love. 
we are not merely to retain our first love. Our love is to grow. And our love is to be increasing. And how tragic then it was concerning that a church in Ephesus. It was not merely that they had not progressed beyond their conversion. It was as if that they had retreated, left their first love. And we live in a day of ecumenism. Many will say to the church of Jesus Christ, come and join with us. We all believe in God. We all say that the Bible it's God's word, at least in some sense. We all believe in Jesus Christ. Let's all get together. And yet we are to recognize the Lord's people are to be distinct. That which is true cannot mix with that which is false. Where there's a rejection of salvation by grace, where there's a rejection of the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot unite. What fellowship have light with darkness? And so in Ezekiel 23, the Lord is saying, you know what happened to Ohab? And today it's as if the Lord is saying to his church, you know what will happen to false religion. God hates it. God will destroy it. And therefore, he says, come out of her, my people. The Lord calls his people to be separate, to be clean. Thus will I make thy lewdness to cease from thee. Thus will I cause lewdness to cease out of the land. The Lord and cleanness away. I want to see then not only the believer's goal and the believer's horror, the believer's correction. For as we look at the chapter, we have to ask the question, why would Jerusalem ever have gone after idolatry? Or to put it into contemporary terms, why would the child of God Turn to uncleanness of any sort. Well, I think Ezekiel 23 makes it clear that when that happens, and as it happened back in Ezekiel's day, there's been a deceiving into thinking there's some attraction in it. And so Ezekiel 23 explains why anyone would turn to it, a doctrine. And it explains how Israel and Judah had turned to spiritual adultery, that they had turned to idolatry, that they had turned to trusting in foreign nations. Remember, that is what this uh, adultery is. And so, uh, through the chapter, we have the word doted, lusted after. If you look at me at verse 6, this is speaking of the northern kingdom of Israel. We'll actually have to read from verse 5 to get the flow. And a whole played the harlot, but she was mine. And she doted on her lovers as the Assyrians, her neighbours, which were clothed with blue, captains and rulers, all of them desirable young men, horsemen riding upon horses. And as the northern kingdom then looked at Assyria, what Ezekiel is being told is this, it's like the young woman looking at a soldier, He's dressed in this attractive uniform. Everything looks attractive. Everything looks desirable. And Judah did the same thing. Verse 12. She doted upon the Assyrians, her neighbors, captains and rulers clothed most gorgeously, horsemen riding upon horses, all of them desirable young men. In verse 14 then it speaks about the Chaldeans, images of the Chaldeans portrayed 
and upon the walls. And they were like the young woman then looking at the pictures. Are all detractive? There's no catch. And yet the truth was that those nations had nothing to offer to the people of God. Just as the soldier in the illustration has nothing to offer to the young woman. And as God's people today then, there are times that we can be attracted to things of the world. It ought not to be so, and yet it is. And we can see some attraction in the world's ways, in the world's entertainments, the world's philosophy. And the truth of it is this, they have nothing to offer to us. They have nothing to give to us that is going to be for our good. And Judah was so deceived that she even tried to make herself look attractive to the foreign nations. And at the end of verse 40, it talks about how she was like the woman washing and painting herself, putting on her ornaments. Uh, I want to make myself look attractive to them. And isn't that the sin of the church in Australia in 2023? The church wants to make herself look attractive to the world. So many then will say, I'm not going to take a stand in creation. If we say we believe in six literal days, we'll look foolish. And so in our church, we are going to talk about evolution. And we'll mix it in with a bit of religion, but we'll try and keep the scientists and try and keep God happy at the same time. But you see, it's the sin of Ezekiel 23. Because in the end, the so-called scientists are no more impressed than they have been at the beginning. The church becomes an object of scorn. And so too in the area of entertainment. Many church meetings, they look more like a pop concert or some worldly entertainment gathering in a place of worship of the Lord. Does it impress the world? Not at all. But it brings destruction. So a child of God would turn to uncleanness because they see some attraction in it, but also because they are forgetful of the Lord. And we saw this theme last week, but just briefly, if you look with me at verse 27, Thus will I make thy lewdness to cease from thee, and thy whoredom brought from the land of Egypt, so that thou shalt not lift up thine eyes unto them, nor remember Egypt any more. And so their minds were filled with the foreign nations, but in verse 35, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast forgotten me. Forgotten me. God, forgetfulness. What is the remedy then? What is the correction? We must see then that our attraction is to be in the Lord Himself. Our attraction is to be in the gospel. And if only we could see that in our day. What is to appeal to us? What is it that is to gladden our hearts? It's the gospel. It's Christ. All of these other things only disappoint. There's no disappointment in our Lord. As we see him as our attraction, then we are to repent of our God forgetfulness. If you look at that verse 35, it says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast forgotten me, 
and cast me behind thy back. The sin was casting the Lord behind their back. But does that not remind us of beautiful words that Hezekiah spoke in the very opposite direction? Hezekiah 38, 17. Thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sin behind thy back. And so what had Judah done? It's as if they had cast the Lord behind their back. <coughs> what were they to do? They were to turn to the Lord like Hezekiah come to understand that the Lord casts sin behind his back. What does that signify? Surely it signifies the record removed. Cast my sins behind thy back. It's the idea that the Lord is no longer looking in the record. It's put from view. It's also got the idea of fellowship restored. Hezekiah's sins cast behind the Lord's back. Hezekiah then was now viewing the Lord's face, not his back. You see, the Lord's back is a symbol of disfavor. The face, a great symbol of the Lord's favor. And here is comfort then for the repentant adultery. And the Lord says, I have cast all your sins behind my back. Here is comfort from the child of God turning from uncleanness. I have cast thy sin behind my back. And the Lord can put away that which alienates. And again, that's a word that we have had in this chapter. We don't have time to and look at that this evening, but in your own time, you can see in verses 17, 18, and 22, the idea of alienation, it actually literally means put out of joint. <clears throat> but the Lord deals with that which alienates. Fellowship is restored. Remember how in Isaiah 50, verse 6, our Saviour speaking there says, I gave my back to the smiters. I gave my back to the smiters. As our Saviour's back was smitten, as our Saviour's back became as a ploughed field, what does it signify? That our sin was taken. It was laid upon him. It was laid upon the back of our beautiful Savior. He took it. Bore it away. He has dealt with it. And today in love and favor, he looks upon his people. And the problem with the whole of our is unfaithful. And may we in brokenness before the Lord tonight at the close of this meeting, may he repent afresh of our unfaithfulness. But rejoice in this, we have a faithful God. A God who has never forsaken his bride. A God who has never forsaken his people. As he says over us today then, my dwelling place is in you. He abides faithful. May the Lord enable us to be as him and be a people of our faithfulness. May the Lord bless his word to all of our hearts. We'll bow together, please, in closing prayer. And may the Lord be pleased to take his word this evening and seal it to our hearts. For any uh, listening this evening without Jesus Christ as Savior, what uncleanness you have as you are before the Lord tonight. 
turn from it. There will be no uncleanness in God's heaven. Come to Christ for mercy, come to Christ for cleansing. This woman and go to sleep. Our gracious Father, we thank thee for thy presence here with us this evening. And we thank thee that those these words that were given so many years ago are ever up to date. They have something for us today. We lament our backsliding. We lament our spiritual adultery. We lament our love of that which thou dost hate. God, continue to deal with our hearts, we pray. Oh Lord, we pray that continuously the gospel will take hold of us. even in an age of ungodliness that you will be a witness for our Lord's great name. Be with us through this week we pray. Oh Lord we pray that today and daily that we will be more conformed to thine image and that we will have a good testimony before and the God of God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and I'll be with you all in Christ Jesus.